What's up my pre-calc people? In this video, I wanna focus on looking at some multiple choice questions that deal with rational and polynomial functions coming out of unit one. Let's take a look at them now. Before we look at any examples, let me remind you that all of these questions were taken from the AP Pre-Calculus course and exam description. Now, in that course and exam description, it says that 20 to 25% of all the multiple choice questions on the AP Pre-Calculus exam will be covering polynomial and rational functions. That's a pretty good chunk, so let's take a look at some of these problems now so we know what to prepare for. All right, the first question says the polynomial function P is given by negative 4x to the fifth plus 3x squared plus 1. Which of the following statements about the end behavior of P is true? All right, so remember end behavior, first we gotta look at the degree of our polynomial. If the degree is even, both ends do the same thing, whether both go up or both go down, but like this function, the degree is odd. Five is an odd number. That means that one side is going up and one side is going down towards infinity. So the left side could be the side that's going up and the right side is the side that's going down or vice versa. The left side could be going down and the right side is going up. Now, which one do you know it is? Well, that's based on the positive or negative of the leading coefficient. So the leading coefficient in this problem is negative four. That's obviously a negative number. That means that the left side is going up and the right side is going down. Now, the other thing you've got to remember is we notate the end behavior of a polynomial function using our limit notation. So we say the limit as x goes towards negative infinity, that's the left, or positive infinity, that's the right. So what we know before, I'm not even looking at any of the answers, by the way, yet. What we know is as we go to the left, the left-hand side is going towards positive infinity, and the right-hand side is going towards negative infinity. So now I just got to figure out which one of these correctly says that. So A has both sides going towards positive infinity. That would be true if we had an even degree with a positive leading coefficient. So that's obviously wrong. Um, let's see here. The part B here says that the left side, again, as X approaches negative infinity, is going up. And the right-hand side, as X approaches positive infinity, is going down. Well, that's exactly what we're looking for. So there's our answer. All right. The other questions had it in reverse order. Um, question C had the left side going down, the right side going up. That would be if we had a positive leading coefficient with an odd degree. And then D says that the left side is going down and the right side is going up as well. So that would be incorrect as well. So the sign of the leading term of P is negative and the, the degree is odd. And that's why B is the correct answer. All right, in this next problem, it says which of the following functions has a zero at X equals three? and has a graph in the xy plane with a vertical asymptote at x equals 2 and a hole at x equals 1. Now, I'm not going to confuse myself by looking at the choices. I'm going to think about building this function based on what's given. Now, if you have a 0 at x equals 3, that means you have a factor of x minus 3 in the numerator only, because if you turn a function into 0, you turn only the numerator into 0. So if I plug in 3 minus 3, I better get a 0 in the numerator only. If I have a vertical asymptote at x equals 2, that means I have a factor of x minus 2 in the denominator only. We know that vertical asymptotes are values that are x values that turn only the denominator into 0. And then finally, if I have a whole at x equals 1, that means I have a factor of x minus 1 in both the numerator and the denominator. Because when you have a whole, that's a value that will turn both numerator and the denominator into 0. Now, could there be some coefficients out in front, like a 2 or a 3 or a 4 or a negative even? Yes, that could all be true. But in its most simplest form, answering or, or you know building a function based solely on these three things, this function right here will do the trick. So if I just simply multiply it out, I get x squared minus 4x plus 3 in my numerator. And then I get x squared minus 3x plus 2 in the denominator. So Look, now look at my choices, and oh my gosh, there it is, choice A for my final answer. If we go ahead and, and want to go ahead and factor these other choices, B, C, and D, we'll realize that some of these things I just talked about got violated. Like maybe you have an X minus 1, but only in the denominator. Well, that's not going to create a whole. To create a whole at X equals 1, we need that factor of X minus 1 in both numerator and denominator. So again, I like to not even look at the choices, use what I know to build the function, and then see if I can find my choice. All right, in this third question, the function g is given by x cubed minus 3x squared minus 18x, and the function h is given by x squared minus 2x minus 35, and k is taking h, dividing it by g. So let's actually write that out. So taking h, that's x squared minus 2x minus 35, and dividing that by g, which was x cubed minus 3x squared minus 18x. Now, what is the domain? Okay, 
Well, the domain needs to exclude, when you have a rational function, any number that turns the denominator into zero. What about the numerator? Don't care. If you turn the denominator into zero, that value must be excluded from the domain. So I'm going to go ahead and factor my denominator. I first notice that all three terms have an x. I'm going to factor out an x. And I get x squared minus 3x minus 18. Need to be able to factor for the AP exam. Then I'm going to continue to factor. I have x, let's see here, minus 6 and x plus 3. Now, that takes you a little bit longer to factor. No big deal as long as you get the factors correct. That means x equals 0 turns the denominator into 0. x equals 6 turns the denominator into 0. And x equals negative 3 turns the denominator into 0. Now, some kids will say, well, what about the numerator? Listen, if... I don't really care. That, that, that might help me understand holes, vertical asymptotes, and zeros, but this question is simply asking about domain, and any number that turns the denominator into zero needs to be skipped. So choice C is the correct answer there. I need to um, skip, or the domain would be all real numbers, except for negative three, zero, and six. All right, in this next question, the figure shown is the graph of a polynomial function G, which of the following could be an expression for G of X. All right, this is actually a really good question. Once again, I'm not going to look at the choices yet to confuse myself. I'm going to look at the graph. I first noticed that there are one, two, three zeros. Three places where we, the function equals zero. But they're a little bit different. So I first noticed that there's one that's negative. So this one right here is going to be negative. So that means I'm going to have x plus a. Now, I'm just choosing A as any number, but X plus A, right? Because that means that I have a um, zero there at negative A. Now, I also notice that the graph crosses through. The, the left-hand side is above. This is all above positive. The right-hand side is negative, so I cross through at that zero. That means I have an odd multiplicity. So that means that on this factor of x plus a, I have an odd number like 1 or 3 or 5. I have an odd multiplicity. Okay, next thing I notice is that over here, I have another zero, but this time it's positive. So that's going to be like x minus b. That would produce a positive zero at x equals b. And I also notice that to the left, it's negative, and to the right, it's positive. So it crosses through at that value, which means I also have another odd multiplicity. So there could be a one here, it could be a three, it could be a five, but I got an odd multiplicity. And lastly, I notice at this zero right here, uh, well, first off, it's positive, so it's going to be like x minus c. It's going to be a positive c is where that happens. But I notice that it's, it touches, right? The left side is positive. The right side is positive. It doesn't cross the x-axis. It doesn't go from positive to negative or vice versa. It's positive on both sides. That means it has even multiplicity. So there could be a 2 here or a 4 or a 6. So now I'm going to look at my choices, and I want to find a choice that has a negative 0, two positive zeros, but one of the positives has to have an even multiplicity. So if I look at A and B, they all have odd multiplicities. This is 5, 1, and negative 8, all with odd multiplicities. Negative 5, negative 1, 8, all with odd multiplicities. I need to have at least one with an even multiplicity. So I'm going to immediately get rid of A and B. Now, C has an even multiplicity, and so does D. But I know that that even multiplicity needs to be a positive zero, which is a factor of x minus c. So that means c has to be the correct answer because x minus 5 would produce a zero at 5. But because as an even multiplicity, it's going to create that touch where it just touches the x-axis, doesn't cross. Now, I could also check that x minus 1 is odd. That's going to produce that positive uh, right there, that positive zero that I see right there. And then I also have x plus eight, which is going to create a negative zero. That can be my value that I see right there. So the answer there is C. All right. And on this last question, I want to note that this was from the calculator section. So notice I put a little calculator here to remind you that this is a problem where you will be able to use a calculator. All right. The temperature in degrees Celsius in a city on a particular day can be modeled with this function. Very ugly, rational function, cubic on top, quadratic on the bottom. Okay. Where T is measured at hours starting at 12 p.m. for values of T to 9. Okay. Based on the model, how many hours did it take for the temperature to increase from 0 degrees to 5 degrees? So we need to figure out what time do we hit 0 degrees, what time do we hit 5 degrees, and we want to figure out the difference between them. How many hours it took to go from 0 to 5. Now, you definitely don't want to try to solve this by hand. 
and try to plug in a zero for the time and try to solve that. And then, I mean, it's way too complicated. And they're telling you, hey, you're going to need to use a calculator. So let's go ahead and use a calculator. Uh, let me walk you through exactly what I would do on my calculator to solve this problem. All right, first thing I'm going to do is bring in my calculator to show you. And I'm actually going to type this into y equals. So go to y equals and type this function in. So take your time. It's a little bit, you know, a lot of numbers there. So double, triple check that you typed it in right. Now, I'm also going to type in under y2 and y3, 0 and 5. That's going to put lines at 0 degrees and at 5 degrees because I want to find how long it takes to go from 0 to 5 degrees. Now, the next thing I want to do is I want to adjust my window appropriately. So for my x's, remember my x's are the time, and it says we're looking at times from 2 to 9. So I went from a 0 to 10 for my x's. That way I covered 2 to 9 inside of that viewing window. Now, for the y's, the y-axis give me my temperatures. I went, again, my temperatures I'm looking for are 0 to 5 degrees. So I went a little bit, I went negative 5 to positive 10 just to give myself a nice little view of this. You know, if you don't get the window set right, you're not going to see everything you want to see. So when I hit graph, now here is my blue function that represents the temperature. And as time ticks by, the temperature is going up. But the red line is where we're at 0 degrees. And the black line is where we're at 5 degrees. So what I could use my calculator to figure out what those times are at those values so I can find the difference between them. Now, to do this, I'm going to use the intersection command. Second trace, I'm going to go down and choose intersect. And it's going to ask me, the first thing is, is first curve. So I'm going to select the blue curve. Then I'm going to select the red curve, the second curve. This is at zero. And then I'm going to guess here to see when this happens. And we see that at um, 5.42 value for t that's hours after 12 p.m that's when we're going to hit zero degrees so 5.42 so i'm going to write that down 5.42 and again that's hours from 12 p.m now i'm going to go back to my graph and this time i'm now going to find the other intersection point second trace go down to intersect here and once again i'm going to select that blue curve and then I'm going to select the black line. So I'm going to go up there and move my cursor up until it selects the black line. That's going to be the five degree line. And then once again, it wants me to guess. So just got to move my cursor a little bit closer there to where that intersection point is. And there it is at 7.70. So the difference between these two values is going to be the time that they're looking for. This is the time it took to get to zero versus the time it took to get to five. The difference between these values is exactly what the question is asking for. And if you do the math on that, 7.07 .07 minus 5.42, we get a time of 2.28 hours to go from zero degrees to five degrees. So hopefully you know how to use your calculator to, to graph the functions. So hopefully your teachers taught you that. And then you can use that intersection command because it's going to make it really convenient and really fast. That way you don't have to do any of this by hand because it would be extremely difficult. All right, that's it for a couple of examples over looking at some multiple choice questions over polynomial and rational functions.